Today we are looking at Viacom CBS stock or VIAC stock which has dropped dramatically over the last few weeks and it's making a lot of people ask is it time to buy the stock appears to be cheap and when I say cheap I mean that it's trading at somewhere between 9 10 times forward earnings which relative to the market which is trading in a mid 20s multiple trading at 9 to 10 times does get me interested that is a cheap valuation now i prefer looking for unrivaled companies but this is a relatively low valuation relative to traditional media profit sending you know profit making cash cow type of companies that viacom cbs is you know and, and look they generated nearly two billion in free cash flow last year and you know seeing this type of multiple is certainly interesting it certainly got my interest and so you know and then you take a quick look at their history you know the stock price despite this dramatic drop over the last few trading sessions you know it, it is actually still significantly above where it was over the prior year so now it's around the mid 40s previously it was in the teens where it was prior year and it's been just an absolutely crazy ride you see how the stock went parabolic you know for a few months in in 2020 and you know one one should understand what sort of drove this recent behavior and we'll talk about that real quick where one is management actually tried to sort of top tick this you know as as the stock price continued to go higher management actually tried to capitalize on this increasingly high valuation by issuing stock and issuing a mandatory convertible preferred stock effectively right here at the tippy tippy top top and so one is i do give management credit for saying hey we're getting a much better valuation than we previously previously did let's raise money now is a great time to raise money so i i definitely do give management credit for for trying to shore up their balance sheet when you know times are good that is that is very prudent approach but let's talk more about this as it's as it's been you know a lot of news around this archegos uh forced you know liquidity uh you know liquidation sales so first you know as you're looking at this price offering of the common stock and mandatory preferred you know they raised a lot of money you know something like 2.6 billion dollars that they raised you know for a company that's already generating you know significant billions in dollars in free cash flow each year it sort of makes me wonder like why now obviously you know they talk about how they're going to be investing in you know general corporate purposes that means acquiring potentially new content as well as in including investments and streaming and we'll talk more about that and how that's a big pivot for the company that they're pushing in terms of their streaming initiatives or direct to consumer initiatives um so it does make me wonder are they going to be burning a lot more money in the future uh and also let, let me be a hundred percent straight you know my thoughts on preferreds i generally don't like when a company issues a preferred uh the reason why i don't like it when a company issues a preferred is because you don't have the same tax advantages that you have with issuing debt when you issue debt you you usually with that interest payment you got to use it to effectively lower your tax burden with preferred it's effectively a payout of profits it's a dividend versus interest payment therefore you don't get to lower your tax burden so i it when a company is issuing preferreds it's generally a symbol that they've uh, a signal that they filled up their balance sheet with debt and that they don't want they can't either take on more debt because it'll result in a downgrade of their debt or they're just there aren't you know there's there's really not a good market for it so now they're doing some sort of you know special equity vehicle like preferred so i i don't like seeing preferred investments it is a little bit of a red flag but let, let's keep going into it into this uh you know so then you know talking about how the stock price just completely capitulated puked in the ensuing days well what's interesting about that is that you know so there's this family office archegos um that effectively had a presumably a couple hundred million dollars in equity that they levered up significantly possibly through some sort of fraudulent behavior working with several different brokers borrowed tens of billions of dollars some something like up to 20 billion dollars and What's interesting is they had make, Archegos had made this big bet on Viacom using some derivative swaps. And their, Archegos's largest prime brokers were Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. And, they, and so here it is, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley effectively doing deals with Archegos, which is buying Viacom stock and then Viacom then hires Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, as well as a couple of other bankers to sell this stock, this common stock and this preferred stock. So they know, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of, 
you know, uh, firewall that prevents information from easily going between divisions. But, you know, when I find out that Morgan Stanley and, and Goldman Sachs were effectively front run the other prime brokers that Orchegos had, I suspect it's because they're like, oh, snap, we've lent billions of dollars and we're now doing this offering of stock. This could really result in, in some sort of avalanche um, as Archegos could explode because this is a huge position for them. So this is sort of shady, but that's a whole other separate conversation. It just struck me as super interesting to see. Um, Okay, so what about the valuation? Is this a time to buy? Um, and so just a quick plug, you know, if this is your first time tuning in, you know, please make a point of subscribing to this channel. This channel tries to focus on potential multi-baggers, types of companies that can go up hundreds or thousands percent over time. So if that's what you're interested in, make sure you subscribe. If you're already a subscriber, I do appreciate that thumbs up. And if you want to follow my personal journey as I try to call out and buy potential multi-baggers, go to unraveledinvesting.com, click on journey i have a monthly update of my portfolio any sort of you know near-term updates in terms of what i buy and material size for my portfolio we're building a like-minded community of thoughtful investors and just additional exclusive content like there will be some exclusive content about viacom that i'll talk about a little bit later so let's let's keep going into this viacom in terms of its potential and, and what they're doing and so uh, you know, as we look at it, first understanding Viacom CBS, it represents a ton of content, a, a ton of different bets, whether or not it's BET or Paramount, Comedy Central, Showtime, a lot of different stuff. And you could see some of the individual shows like, you know, Star Trek or some legacy, you know, this legacy library, Godfather, the Titanic, um, you know, a lot of popular TV shows. And they're spending tens of billions of dollars on content so that they can be a very relevant player. And they have a lot of key, you know, sports and news items that really get people's interest. We'll get into that in a second. But, you know, one should understand they're trying to modernize a legacy dying business model, or at least a struggling business model, which, you know, historically was a business model based on distributors. And, you know, effectively either TV stations that are affiliated TV stations of CBS or distributors that own the relationship to the consumer, like cable companies or satellite TV companies. And from that, you had advertising revenue from your, your shows that were playing through your TV stations, as well as affiliate fees paid from these distributors, as well as content licen licensing. As you produce content, then you, let's say, you license it out to a Netflix or you license it out to another you know library. They also, you know with Paramount, they are creating their own movies and things like that. But the bulk of their profits, as you'll see in a second, the bulk of their revenue really have historically come from these three attributes, these three key segments, advertising, affiliate, and content licensing. And now they're trying to modernize with establishing streaming or direct consumer relationships. Uh, and, you know, just, just for perspective, you know, you have a company with 25 billion in revenue in 2020, uh, which is down a bit from the 27 billion in 2019. And, you know, you could see the three biggest components of this were advertising at 9.8 billion, affiliate fees at 9.2 billion and content licensing at nearly 6 billion and then you know theatrical and other don't even make up a billion now theatrical obviously did take a hit and you know their revenues you know in business model did take a hit during covid you know advertising was down 12 percent during the year while affiliate was up seven percent but part of this is skewed by the fact that they do have some hyper growth streaming assets which we'll talk about in just a second but you know this is a tricky business model because they're going to effectively try to pivot away from the traditional sources where they made these revenue drivers and pivot sort of year by year as as you face potential cord cutting into a direct and consumer relationship where the distributors the the other parties that own the relationship they're sort of being commoditized they're no longer a real valuable component in this ecosystem it's who if you can own a direct consumer relationship you should do it and that's the that's sort of the push with streaming and so you know when i talk about modernizing the legacy business model you know you have the fees from tv stations affiliated with CB, cbs the television network and these distributors like comcast verizon you know dish spectrum direct tv and so it's it's taking these assets and sort of saying well wait a second these, you know, with cord cutting, you know, cable providers, they're losing share each year. And so you're, well, wait a second, the fees that they're going to be able to pay 
for access to these things to effectively say, hey, we liked it, we want to carry these things, they can't pay as much because they have fewer subscribers. And the same type of problem with TV stations is that their ad revenue that you're getting with TV stations and sort of the affiliated fees, they become worth less over time as people effectively don't tune in to the TV stations or or are going, you know, they're, they're effectively choosing to stream. And so both segments are under pressure, you know, long term. So this is really a pivot strategy for them where they are trying to make some big bets on streaming, direct consumer assets. Uh, and so far they have something like 30 million global streaming subscribers. They've made this bet on Pluto TV, which is effectively an ad-based model. So they have lots of content, a lot of legacy content in their Pluto TV, which is primarily an ad-driven business model. And overall, if you're looking at this, they're generating 3.6 billion on a run rate basis for global streaming revenue. So this this includes both advertising as well as subscription. So their, their subscription is now two different price points for Paramount Plus, um, which includes this, this Paramount Plus was is the new rebrand for CBS All Access, which includes a lot of this content. And so it's it's really challenging for, for you to go pivot from this model where you're effectively relying on all these distributors to start saying, hey, we want to own the relationship. And honestly, they're late to the party. This is years after Netflix has been making a push to say, hey, we want to own that relationship. We think owning that direct consumer relationship will be valuable over time. You know, but look, you got to give them credit. They are getting traction where their global, you know, streaming and digital video revenue was up 70% in the most recent quarter and, you know, nearly 50% year over year. So you got to give them credit for making that bet and trying to make it happen. And they are seemingly starting to get traction. You know, and you can see another example where they think, so So I earlier mentioned $3.6 billion on a run rate basis, but if you look on the actual 2020, it was $2.6 billion. They think they can get to something like $7 billion plus in just the next few years. So that's, you know, ballpark around $5 billion in revenue potential. But one needs to understand that that is largely offsetting, you know, I would say that that's going to be balanced out. That $5 billion revenue potential is going to be balanced out with offsetting declines in these other segments, I would expect, you know, this content licensing, it's not like you can really license out a lot of this content. You're, you're not going to be growing the amount of content licensing when effectively you're going to have to need it for your own direct consumer, you know, library that, that you're using. And so that's, you know, that, that, that is, you know, a key risk, but they are, look, they are planning on growing. So here's the revenue potential for global streaming, 5 billion plus, and their global Pluto TV monthly average users is currently around 43 million you know they think they can they can effectively triple this over the next few years so this is a business model in transition no question about it so there's a potential that they stay the same there's a potential that it declines a bit there's a potential that it even increases a bit it's it's sort of tough to say it's it's a going to be a tough balancing act and that's part of the reason why it trades at this low valuation that said they do have a lot going for it. I mean, look, they do, they recently acquired, you know, NFL exclusivity rights through 2033 season. You know, this includes some of the Super Bowl. So that's a big deal. They have the number one, you know, most watched network in daytime and late night. So this, you know, it's not like they, they have, they have content that people want. This is, don't want, this is number one news magazine, number one drama series, number one new comedy, number one late night show. So, I mean, there's a lot of content that people really like. You know, they're making deals to acquire more and more sports content. So they really, they do have a chance of not only being stable, but potentially growing as well. Um, they do have a lot going for it. Uh, no question about it. I prefer just from a competitive standpoint, you know, looking at something like Netflix, which already has the 200 million plus global subscribers, you know, it does create it. It, it makes it a lot easier for them to bank on, oh, this is how much we can spend on content this year. And that's honestly, they're in, you know, Net Netflix is in an advantageous position because of that. And that's part of the reason why they trade at a much premium valuation relative to CBS, relative to Viacom CBS, um, where Netflix is saying, hey, we're gonna outspend you by a couple billion dollars a year. Um, but that adds up, that adds up with a lot of TV shows. Um, but if you think they can successfully pivot from sort of this legacy distributor model to direct-to-consumer model, then 
you know, you'd say, well, wait a second, then what's the valuation? And look at the valuation, you know, let's ignore, I, I would say ignore some of 2020. The, the deal closed, I think, at the end of 2019 for CBS and Viacom. So let's let's look at the figures that they were putting out of what they think they could do, um, excluding synergies, as they said. So they, you know, they were effectively calling out you know, six billion plus in operating income before depreciation and amortization, or about six billion operating profit. Um, this inc this excludes you know one-time restructuring charges. But if you look at this and think, well, wait a second, they do have some sizable debt. You know, they have you know nearly two to three times leverage. So that is a fully levered business model. Um, so you need to subtract you know subtract out let's say a billion in interest expense a year. Plus, they're now going to have some preferred, but you can ignore that for for the most part because it's relatively small relative to sizable debt expense, which you know before the most recent capital raise was close to twenty billion dollars in debt. So you know, let's say one billion in interest expense, six billion in operating profit. So six billion less one billion. You know, then you you, you slap on a twenty five percent tax rate, and you know you're you're probably going to be around. So you could think about the potential profit if. If you believe they can successfully transition this business model and that they can over time own that direct to consumer, then you can think three to four billion profit potential. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I do like and prefer Netflix's model. I mean, partly, you know, there's a reason why Netflix doesn't get into all this sports stuff is because who owns the relationship with the sports? You know, the sports ultimately is what drives people to the the platform, like. Viacom CBS or, or Paramount Plus, but it's not permanent. And so they get pricing power over time, which does hurt your margins and forces you to raise pricing. Whereas Netflix, look, they're just, they're building out their own completely owned library, which could mean higher margins for them over time and better pricing power. But, you know, that said, look, this is, this is what they were penciling out three to four billion in profit potential for CBS and Viacom based on their current share price around four to two bucks a share. That implies around $27 billion valuation. So three to four billion profit potential after tax profit potential around six to nine times potential profit. So that is really cheap. So if you, if you really strongly believe that this business model will not only sort of sustain itself, but will thrive in this pivot, then I'd argue this is still this is this is a compelling valuation. Um, you know, e even though it's up dramatically from where it was last year, it's still reflecting you know a lot. It, it's effectively a, a discounted valuation, especially relative to the market, six to nine times. Now, I I don't have super high confidence in that, partly because you know at the end of the day, this I I don't view them as unrivaled. Um, you know, and as and that's that's the name of this channel, unrivaled investing is. I'm trying to focus on companies that I think are unrivaled. And like, for example, part of the reason why their advertising revenue took a hit in COVID was because advertisers were like, we need to make sure whatever we spend is spent on the highest ROI that we can spend on or best return on investment. And sort of spending on these big channels like, hey, let's just show a bunch of car ads and hopefully it'll drive more, more interest in our brand. That isn't as valuable as some of these online platforms where it, it's much easier to calculate, oh, this is your return on investment. You generate this much interest in your brand on some of these online you know, uh, platforms or online advertising drivers. And so, you know, I, I think this stock is cheap. I don't think they're unrivaled. And so I'm, I'm not compelled to pull the trigger. And so I personally haven't pulled the trigger. That said, you know, some people that do like, you know, let's say bargain shopping or trying to find things on the cheap could argue Viacom CBS is a cheap stock. It does have that potential. You know, I part of my part of my hesitancy as well is I also expect tax rates to be going up over time. And if capital gains taxes are going up over time, playing the game of, hey, let's just buy this at cheap multiple and sell when it gets higher, that is at a disadvantage relative to this approach of if you find a company that you think is unrivaled, just hold on to it as it compounds over time and you don't have to pay that tax bill. And that's that's a stronger, I, I would say, great better potential for, for after-tax returns. Um, I also, if you're interested in cheap stocks, I also did post uh, a video about Alibaba, which you can see uh, over here. It's a stock that I, I do own. Um, and I also, you know, if you're interested in my personal journey, I did call out 
uh, a one stock, a multi-bagger. Each month I call out potential multi-baggers at unraveledinvesting.com, click on journey. And this past month I did call out a stock that I am buying that I think has 4X potential. And so for something like this, you know, it's, it's less likely that you get 4X potential because you're not really banking on them growing significantly. It's more like hopefully they offset any cord cutting sort of associated declines um, with their direct to consumer efforts um, and hopefully you get some sort of valuation expansion. Like if this goes from six, let's say seven times normalized profits or, or potential profits to 14 to 20 times, then you're like, okay, maybe it doubles, maybe it triples. Like that's, that's the potential that you're looking at. I much prefer sort of the, those unrivaled companies. And I, well, I haven't bought Viacom. I definitely understand why some people have. And I'm grateful to all the people that have reached out to me, both on Discord, the Unrivaled Investing, you know, d investor community on Discord that pinged me and said, hey, you know, check this out. We think it's potentially an unrivaled price. I thought that was cute. Um, but I, so I, I understand. Uh, and I'm grateful that you called it to my attention. Also, all the folks on YouTube calling that out. Uh, I will post an exclusive follow-up video on Viacom. There's some other aspects that I think are pretty interesting. So if you are a Viacom shareholder, I think you'd want to tune in for that, but that will be exclusively for Journey subscribers. And if you enjoyed this video, you know, learning and, and hearing my take on Viacom, please make a point of subscribing and hitting that thumbs up button. Thanks so much for watching.